In this talk, we'll start with unbiased sampling. So the following methods are taken from the field of stereology. And if you want more info on stereology, which is the unbiased measurement of morphometry using probes, you can find that at stereology.info and several other places on the web. Stereology is required for some major journals now, and so it's becoming a highly regarded way in which to measure from samples. So first of all, let's talk about not sectioning until the experimental design is in place. So when you do a study, you want to make obviously a pilot study at first to determine whether or not your study is giving you values that make sense. Let's start by determining the following. You have to figure out how you're going to randomize sectioning. You're going to have to figure out the frequency and number of sections that are required and how many fields, in other words, how many places where you've taken pictures, how many of those fields are measured per section. So when you talk about sections and fields, here is a blob of some kind of biological material. You section it at all the way along here. I'm showing just three sections. And then within those sections, you're taking pictures, and I'm calling those fields. In general, for studies, you really need a large number of animals. And according to stereology, you need seven to account for biologic variability. Then you need a large number of sections. And finally, you need a smaller number of fields. So it's less fields, more sections, and enough animals. Generally, in the scientific research I've seen, the idea is to get a great number of fields, not so many sections, and possibly working with only an N of two. Obviously, in biological research, it can be hard to get a lot of animals. But the mistake to me that's so often made is not so many sections are used, and then a great number of fields are examined. So it really should be that a lot of sections are used, and then not so many fields are measured. So when you talk about the frequency of measurement for counts, a total of 200 to 600 counted objects generally fulfills requirements. And often, you will use one-fifth of the sections. But once the frequency is determined, then what you want to do is use a random start value and then use multiples of that value to determine which sections and fields. So if your random number generator provides a value of 6, you count forward six and section or measure from there and then count forward again six and so on. So here's a nerve sample, uh, a cross section. And in this sample, you can see that the first thing you would need to do is really only measure from the nerve area. Once you've determined that you're going to measure from that nerve area, you're going to determine how many pictures you can get at higher magnification of that nerve. Obviously, when you are looking at that, you have to think about the fact that some of these areas that you might take an image of are at borders, and so you wouldn't want to count anything there or take measurements there. Also, where there's non-tissue area is another place where you would not want to take uh, any pictures of this particular nerve. So if you're using a random number generator and that generator tells you to start with six, then you measure at every six field. So if you're working your way along here, you'd start, you'd start at the top left of the uh, nerve, and then you would take a picture not at the first position or second position or at the third position where it's uh, at the border, you would then count forward until you hit the sixth position, and there is where you would take a picture. And then you'd move forward in increments of six to get the remainder of the images. So once you have an image, once you're within the field of view, then what can you do? You don't really need to measure the entire image, and you definitely don't want to measure the cells that are cut off at the edges. What you would like to do is to make a grid and then only measure or sample at those particular grids that are a multiple of some kind of random number generator value. So in this instance, if we went forward six and measured only at those positions, we'd have, we'd measure really only here in these spots with this bottommost grid square 
we don't have the tissue completely filling it, so we would use another method that I'll talk about in a minute. You could also, if you're doing fluorescence intensity measurements, you could also measure where the brightest cells are located and then use X number of those. Um, we're really good as, as humans at looking at brightest areas, and so this kind of an experiment can be repeated at another lab. Uh, note as well that when you're measuring the brightest cells, none of your measurements contain oversaturated pixels. So what are some general rules to follow? We've already decided that if a location's at the edge, we don't want to measure it, but also if it has folded or damaged tissue, we can make a rule such as go to the next location and measure. And as long as you're consistent about doing that, then you're fine. Uh, if a location half includes a grid box, then you can estimate that fraction, call it one half, and record that with other data. But you must also consider which cells to include based on sectioning issues and edges of images where cells are cut off. So you're going to have some cells removed by the blade when it's sectioned. You're going to have cells that are cut off at the edges. And so it's best to measure in the middle Z depth of a section. Or you can use another rule, such as measure only at areas where the nucleus or cell is at the widest diameter. These rules you can set, and as long as you're consistent about them and you explain them in your methods section, you can consistently and randomly measure from specimens. Now let's talk about thresholding. So when we're thresholding, we're going to set a cutoff pixel tone above or below which all pixel tones are included. So if I were to look at that sort of a thing in Photoshop, if I were to set a threshold, then all values above 128 are going to be white, all values below 128 are going to be black. When you use thresholding, often it's used in morphometry where you're getting counts, areas, lengths, etc. Or it's used for 3D reconstructions from confocal and other optical sections. When you do thresholding, the idea is to maintain some sort of objectivity. So for multiple images, you'd like to use a single threshold, a single threshold value. Or you want some other means to objectively set threshold despite sample to sample differences. So there are three methods that I'll present here. One is for typically for fluorescence where you are going to determine a non-positive dim signal tone, one that's considered non-specific, but the brightest dim signal possible. Or you can make all images identical in tonal range and use a single threshold against all of those for measurement. Or you could use a subjective threshold. In other words, you could subjectively determine threshold from image to image, but if you're going to do that, test against a reference image, and we'll talk more about that later. Let's talk about fluorescence first. Talk about determining a non-positive dim signal tone to then determine the threshold value. In Photoshop, you'd want to use the sampling tool in the info palette to find dim fluorescence considered to be non-specific, and then you use the max tonal value as the threshold setting. So here in Photoshop, we have a fluorescence image, and you can see that there are brighter parts of this image that you would want to measure in dimmer parts where there's some fluorescence or some value that's above background where you wouldn't want to measure. And so what you need to do then is determine what the brightest signal is here in the non-specific areas so that you can then set a threshold that's above that. To do that, you go to the eyedropper tool and you choose the color sampler tool. Once you get the color sampler tool up in the submenu, you need to set then how much of an average you want to use in order to determine a value. At the same time, in the palettes, you want the info palette to be showing. So I'm going to go in now and sample some areas where I don't want to measure. So this area here appears to be non-specific, and so I'm going to find the brightest part of that area and take a measurement. I'll find the brightest part of this area, take a measurement. Here's another place where there's bright signal. I'll take a measurement there, and just for fun, I'll take a measurement here. 
Now if I go over here to look at my info palette, I'm going to find the brightest fluorescence. Here it's shown as 141, and that's the value I'm going to use for my threshold. So if I go now under Image Adjustment Threshold, I can simply type in the value 140, which is close enough to 141, and say OK. And that's an objective way of setting the threshold value. I would do the same thing for another channel, in this instance a green channel, and go through the same process. In MSJ, you use a drawn region of interest and then sample that area to find the dim fluorescence regarded as nonspecific, and then again use the max tonal value as the threshold setting. If I am in image J with the same image, I can use a icon here, the box icon, the rectangle icon, and I can actually outline areas that I would like to measure from. And then using control M, I can get a measurement and see what the mean is. And I can measure from several areas and do the same thing in order to determine what the greatest mean is. I'm just going to do two positions here, and this one shows 139. And so in this program, I could then set the threshold at 140. To obtain a single threshold value for all images, you can make all images identical in tonal range. Here's an instance in which that was done using the color match function in Photoshop in order to histogram match these images. You could see these darker images on the bottom were all histogram matched, and all of these images look identical in terms of their tonal range. This match color method, which by the way is best for grayscale images made into RGB color, can be used to match the tonal range of variously exposed images, thus giving us the opportunity to use a single threshold value. To do that in Photoshop, uh, here I have two images, one that's darker than the other, and I want to match the darker image to the lighter image. First of all, the image has to be in color mode, RGB color mode. Once it's in that mode, you can go to adjustments and then go to match color. To set tones of one image to match the other under source, choose the other image, and now both tonal ranges will match. The other filter that can be used is the high pass filter and you use it at a measured diameter of the object. So you match the diameter of the object to the high pass value that you use in Photoshop or in Image J. In general, the high pass filter overcomes differences from sample to sample, tonal, contrast, etc. so that a single threshold can be used. In Photoshop, that's done simply by measuring the length of the objects you wish to threshold. So in this instance, you can see that we have smaller cells. And so if I want a threshold so that only the smaller cells are included, I can simply measure that length by going under the eyedropper tool to the ruler tool. And then I can measure the distance across one of these cells and maybe choose the largest cell look in my info box at the length, and the length here is 21 pixels. Before I take a measurement, I actually go in and use the high pass filter, and here then I type in that value, 20, say OK, and then under image adjustment, I could set a threshold at a value that then makes sense. So once I get that threshold value, and let's say it's 108, that's the value that I choose, I can now use that value for the rest of the images that I use, uh, that I measure from, were I to then use the high pass filter. The high pass filter is also in image J, uh, and you can try that in image J as well. So the final method that can be used is a subjective threshold, and then you'd need to test against some sort of a reference image. This is perfectly legitimate, although not always desired, because there's a 
fear that it can't be corroborated in another lab. In Photoshop, you can see that I have this image and then I have a second image that's darker. Uh, what I want to do is always test myself against this image when I'm setting the threshold. So if I go under Image, Adjustments, and then set a threshold, I'm going to set that threshold at a certain value. And let's say that value is 182. Then later what I want to do, uh, or repeatedly what I want to do, is set that value only this time, not look at what that value is and simply look at the image to determine whether or not I set it at the same place. And generally you're pretty close once you train yourself to be able to do this. So then what that means is when I go into a darker image like this one, I can set the threshold visually. And even if that threshold value is different, what I'm trying to do is look for the same amount of smaller particles that are removed before I set that value. And now I'm getting approximately the same level of thresholding for each image even if there are sample-to-sample -sample differences. Again, that might seem to be a little too subjective, but for an article for science, uh, this method was used and it was corroborated by other labs. And so it is something that can be used, but you would definitely need some kind of a reference image against which to test yourself.